I always keep in mind one of the last questionnaires um, that I had when I was teaching undergraduate, which was about 16 years ago now. But I was never quite sure what to do with these questionnaires because you look at them and he talks too much, he talks too little, he, we have too much to read, we don't have enough to read. You sort of add them up and divide by the number and, and you have a, something in the middle. But there is always a last question, which is, you know, say anything you want to, which actually used to be kind of fun. Uh, so I started flipping through these, and there was one that said, if I had a terminal disease, where would I like to spend the last hour of my life? <laughs> well, the answer was in Weiss's class, because the last one seemed like an eternity. So <laughs> I, I will go from there. Um, the uh, humanitarianism's contested culture. What I want to do this evening is to talk about, when we're talking about culture, this is values, the kinds of language you use, and what we actually do. Um, and the, the, let me fast forward to the end, which is that I would like to see a different culture, one that's devoted to learning and to analysis and not simply reaction. This argument, for me anyway, has become particularly acute uh, in the post-Cold War era, Klaus, um, because of three trends. Uh, the militarization of humanitarian action, the politicization of that action, and the market, marketization, if you will. The traditional culture um, actually Francesca sort of assumed everyone was on the same page here the earlier. But there, from the way I view things, there's been much weeping and gnashing of humanitarian teeth because the guiding principles uh, that the ICRC devoted itself to and that have become part of humanitarian DNA um, don't provide much guidance any longer or may not provide much guidance any longer. When I'm traveling, I'm always picking up pens because I'm losing them. And I don't have the one that I got because I keep losing them. But it was, I gave a talk to the staff at ICRC in 1998. And when we arrived, we were given a pen. And I, this is really true. There's a, there's a, there was a little window uh, you know, through which you could see things. And when you did this, it said humanity, and then when you did this, it said independence, and then it was neutrality and impartiality, and it kept going around. Uh, so the theme here is that <laughs> we had the quote earlier, uh, Fulker, you mentioned Michael's quote about life getting complicated. Well, anyway, humanitarianism ain't what it used to be. And what I'd like to do is say that of those four so-called principles, there's really only one first order principle, which is humanity, respect for life. The other three were developed not as principles, but really as guidelines to what made most sense in certain kinds of crises, particularly in our national wars and natural disasters. The other three, independence, I'm the person who's in charge, I call the shots, neutrality, I don't really come down on one side or the other, and impartiality, I really help anybody everywhere without regard to location, race, gender, affiliation, religion, etc. So, what's happened during this period? Well, first of all, militarization. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm sort of partially responsible for what I speak. Um, but there are two things that have happened with the military in this period of time. One, they dispose of resources that everyone would like. There's a, a you know, plastic sheeting, medicine, water, the whole works, and transport, and intelligence. This, of course, is not new in the sense that uh, this country and Japan were occupied after the Second World War, and the military got into the business of planning, got into the business of logistics, got into the business of helping with food. But it's really the second function of the military that we've seen in this period of time which is providing security, doing what only the military can do. And whether we look at the aftermath of the Persian Gulf War, Somalia, Rwanda, Kosovo, most recently Libya, 
when a state is unwilling or unable or is the perpetrator of abuse, occasionally, not always, occasionally, the outside international community of states comes to the rescue. Well, clearly, when you get involved with the military, their priorities, their intelligence, their transport, and when the UN gets involved with a Chapter 7 decision, the idea that you're not on one side or the other is um, pretty dicey. So, this phenomenon makes it necessary to say that that first big guideline um, of whether that you're not independent, you certainly are no longer neutral, you can try to be impartial. And I always try to think here of another researcher, um, Gil Losher, who was a Notre Dame, is now at Oxford, who lost three limbs in August 2003 in Iraq. And when he tried to explain <laughs> what was going on, he said he thought there was a problem when we had to drop pamphlets from helicopters in Arabic explaining that humanitarians were not like the military forces on the ground. Uh, so whether or not you are or think you can be, how you're perceived, it's almost impossible. Politics. It seems to me that there are four things that I want to talk about just quickly. Civil wars instead of interstate conflict. We don't have to argue about what are the percentages of, of civilians who are suffering these things. What we have to see is that civilians and their whereabouts have become part of the calculations of wars. This puts an impossible burden on humanitarians. Second of all, government donors have moved away from more or less untied resources to more or less tied resources. Uh, they're the ones who are saying where you go, who gets the assistance, etc. Third, humanitarians themselves have decided that putting Band-Aids on won't do the job. We've got to address the root causes of conflict, we've got to address human rights, and then, oh, by the way, there's post-conflict uh, reconciliation. This is now another impossible layer. And finally, of course, in the post-9-11 world, um, uh, Colin Powell said it best, uh, NGOs and humanitarians are force multipliers. So whether you're identified with the US government or the French government in Central Africa, with the African Union or the UN, NATO or ECOWAS, uh, you're perceived as being part of the politics of the problem. So, as I said, this isn't what we were used to talking about in traditional humanitarian culture. And then in addition, there's a factor, the market. And the three come together to create an identity crisis. Now this third factor, Silke was kind enough to mention a, a, a book I've written because I got really fascinated with the incentives and the disincentives for coming to the rescue and what goes on in war zones. The book is titled Humanitarian Business and on the cover there's a, a Red Cross kit with uh, dollars and euros and other things flowing out of it. This was designed to irritate all of my friends in Geneva, but it was also designed to send a message that this is not just provocative, there's a certain accuracy in thinking about the marketplace. Um, because the adjective is associated with everything good, the Good Samaritan jumps to mind, uh, humanitarians are apolitical, they rescue people, they occupy the moral high ground. Whereas business, it's somewhere else, less lofty territory for sure. Uh, practitioners operate where money buys access. The common good is ignored. Talk is cheap. Tough decisions about profits ignore human costs. Well, the book and my argument here is that reality is quite otherwise. Uh, the culture that we're seeing is no longer one of pulling together. The incentives are to go your own way. Uh, humanitarians are steeped in politics. How could it be otherwise? Their operations intersect with uh, home and host governments, armed insurgent, militaries, peacekeepers, local populations. Where they get their money and to whom they give their money has enormous political and economic consequences. For them in headquarters and for them in the war zone. So, in this post-Cold War era, the latest chapter in humanitarians' uh, long history, there 
the, the main phenomenon is the expansion of suppliers. Who's in the arena? Obviously, the number of UN organizations hasn't uh, increased. Their budgets have enormously. But when you're looking at a particular crisis, depending on how you're counting, um, and uh, Antonio's former colleagues at, at Tufts tried to put numbers on this, but there are probably 2,500 NGOs flocking around. And if you include prevention and post-conflict peace building and, and development, there are probably 37,000 international NGOs. And so at any moment, there are probably 1,000 of these folks kicking around in addition to the um, dysfunctional UN family, if we're speaking about families. The global bottom line here is around $20 billion, not a trivial figure. It actually slipped back a little. That was the highest figure in 2011. It was about 19 in 2012, and we're back a little below that now. But what's extraordinary if you try to plot this is to think about 1989, when it was $800 million globally. 10 years later, it's $4 billion. 10 years later, it's 17 billion and we're now at 20. So this, you know, we have lots of mom and pop stores, but we also have some major players with major sums of money. So the market drives for-profit businesses. We're all willing to think about that. It also drives humanitarians. Uh, there are lots of other things that drive humanitarians, but the market is critically important. No, Naomi Klein has probably been the least kind call it, talking about disaster capitalism, yeah. but you get, you get the picture. Um, at the very least, I think David Kennedy's book, The Dark Sides of Virtue, really sums up the impossible conundrum in which humanitarians find themselves. We spoke this morning about propaganda, public relations, images. Um, the image, and, and we spoke, uh, uh, Charlotte spoke about the image of children, which is probably the most powerful in sort of plucking heartstrings and opening purse strings. Um, and so the, the branding is quite important because resources, even though they're abundant, are still scarce. And if I have them, you may not. And for the latest year for which figures are available, 2012, about, not quite two-thirds, 63% of supposed needs identified by the, the United Nations were filled. So we argue over these money. It seems to me that the image that I think is the best one um, is in, it was in an article by actually a couple of young guys who was work I helped set up 20 years ago. J Jim Ron and Alex Cooley talked about the scramble the NGO scramble, and you sort of get the, get, get the pictures here. And while we were talking about propaganda and somebody, I, I can't remember if there's a question, it's, it's really marketing is a, a better way to look at it, I suppose. And if you were at the Harvard Business School or you're in CARES headquarters, you were concerned about the four Ps, product, your product, your price, your, the place, and how you promote it. So. Um, you know, what's to be done? Um, I don't usually quote my mother um, because I usually didn't pay much attention to her. But she, when, when I was trying to avoid uh, chores, she'd look, glare at me and say, you know, you nimbus, don't just stand there, damn it, do something. Well, my recommendation is turning my mother's on ahead, that is, don't just do something. That's what humanitarians are basically known for, but stand there. What I'm calling for is slightly more reflection and less reaction. There have been efforts over the last 20 or 25 years to improve this, but there have been really, really far too few of these. And it talks about training, preparation, qualifications of aid workers. If you can ask your physician to be accredited, if you can ask your tax accountant to be accredited, it seems to me that we ought to use some of the same language for humanitarians. So my proposal here, and this will not please humanitarians, is that I would like the humanitarian equivalent of military science. Now, 
Most people uh, who look at the military would say, oh, it's easy, they're fat, they get too much money, parliaments throw resources at them. We can't do that amongst humanitarians. I would argue that, <laughs> that humanitarians ought to do exactly the same kinds of things. That we don't, that we need insight, we don't want intuition. That rather than running after the next emergency, you need to slow down and try to at least unpack some of the things that have happened in the past. Why? Personnel are specific targets. We've got record numbers of deaths. Insignia, Red Cross or anything else, no longer afford any protection. And emergency responses are now part of a, a complex package um, from prevention to post-conflict. Um, so the, the argument here is that the military, which invest resources. They have historians and operations. This is not a, a self-serving plea for more historians. I'm not a historian. But it does seem to me that one needs to track what's going on while it's going on. Uh, and that social science can have a true value added here of gathering information, organizing it, interpreting it, and disseminating it. Obviously, the business of delivery and protection is for aid officials, but it seems to me there's a really good potential partnership here. So, my pen, what I want to say is that, that humanity is a first order principle. The others are uh, means, not ends. Sometimes they provide guidance, sometimes they do not. And it seems to me that what I'd like humanitarians to do is go begin to question these and how they're applied. That the gold standard of the ICRC, which comes close to being an ideology and not a set of guidelines, needs to be called in questions. It's precisely because of the dark sides of virtue, it seems to me, that it's critical to move ahead in this direction. Uh, rather than a priori judgments about what we're going to do, we do not need idealistic vocabulary and its institutional machinery. We need to look not at intentions, but consequences. Not at inputs, but outputs. We need to see what is the result. So modesty, of course, is a virtue, uh, not just for social scientists, but for humanitarians as well. And I've always been, and I have problems with my, some of my humanitarian friends, because they use the word, there's a humanitarian imperative. The moral obligation to treat all vulnerable populations everywhere, similarly, react consistently, wherever crises occur. Well, besides the fact that we don't have an unlimited resources, no two crises are the same. This notion of an imperative flies in the face of politics. And it seems to me that well, physicians would talk about triage. What I want to talk about is consequentialist ethics. And if you believe in consequentialist ethics, then you're not talking about an imperative. You're really talking about an impulse. Not impulsive, but impulse. Sometimes we can act. Sometimes we cannot. An impulse is permissive. An imperative is peremptory. You have decisions to make not rigid moral absolutes to apply. So in this context of cultures and what works and what doesn't work, um, many use the word dilemma. Well, for me, it's, it's really a quandary would be more apt. A dilemma involves two choices, alternative courses, and you've got unintended, uh, unavoidable, and equally unpalatable consequences. Well, if, if they're equally unpalatable, you can remain on the sidelines. I'm not talking about remaining on the sidelines. But if you're in a quandary or you're perplexed, you make a good faith effort to try to look at the facts, look at the past, and make a decision that amounts to what's kind of the least worst option. So it seems to me that the calculations here are inescapable and painful and ag agonizing. But the, the new culture is not one of blindly moving ahead, but one of lessons and consequentialist ethics. Um, it seems to me that 
humanitarian action has a very nice ring to it. And strategy, that's for people who do foreign policy and international peace or international security. It's not for us. Well, what we actually need is humanitarian strategy, strategic thinking as an investment in strategic doing. So the, the beginning, uh, this, it's called humanitarians, culture is contested, increasingly so. I think that's a good thing. Um, we're no longer, or we should no longer be following principles in an unquestioned and blind way. It's not necessarily a culture of cooperation, it's one of competition, and you have to make peace with that. Um, the subtitle here, for those of you who haven't read Bad Children's Literature, Pollyanna. Now, Pollyanna actually looked kind of like Silke, always cheery. But Pollyanna, her, her father said, you've got to always put the positive spin on things. She got, somebody gave her crutches for Christmas, and he said, well, you know, you should be thankful you don't need them. Sure, Pollyanna was not pleased with that gift. So I don't think this is a role model. Uh, instincts and goodwill are no longer adequate. I think they actually never were. Uh, but it seems to me that the kinds of critical looks and analysis of what's going on will actually increase the tensile strength of the International Humanitarian Safety Net, and we should all be directed that way. I'm going to stop there.